So uh, last time we talked about axial stresses, um, and since we've talked about um, normal and shear forces, you're probably not surprised that we're going to talk about shear stress. So let's get going. So we talk about normal stresses in an axially uh, loaded bar like this guy. Now we want to look at a situation that's dominated by a shear stress uh, like this one here. And so we can see in this situation, there's a large force F, uh, but it's unsupported down here. Uh, and so there's nothing down here to hold um, this bar in place, right? And so you need some other kind of force that's going to hold that bar in place. And that's a shear force, right? So you're getting a shear force in planes AB here and plane AC that are resisting that force F. Shear stress is generally more complex than axial or normal stresses. Um, but uh, for today, we're going to take a relatively straightforward view of it. In a situation like this, um, we can think of this as being the shear stress here. It's really just acting in one direction. Um, and we can figure, well, there are two faces that would, that shear force is acting. So we have an internal resultant shear force along here and another one along that AB plane. Uh, and those have to equal that F. If this element in the center, ABCD, is going to stay in the same place, we need to have equilibrium in the Y direction, in the up-down direction. And we can just write that V1 is equal to V2. We don't have any reason for symmetry. We can assume that V1 and V2 are the same uh, and that they're going to be equal to half of F. So that's pretty straightforward, right? What's holding that center of the bar in place? Uh, a shear force. Now, uh, we're going to make a simplification here that uh, later in the class we'll, we'll C isn't uh, exactly accurate, but uh, it'll work for us now. Uh, and then we're going to assume that the shear forces, the local shear forces, are spread evenly around that face. In other words, the stress is going to be the same everywhere uh, in the bar. And so we can write that our average stress, the average shear stress, that is tau, is going to be equal to V over A. So uh, the internal resultant shear force divided by the area. And as you can see, that looks a lot uh, like uh, the earlier uh, equation. So you can get your microscope. Microscope. That's not a microscope. That's a whatever. What, what is that? I've got one right here. Um, anyway, he's looking at the equation. <laughs> So let's see why shear stress is more complex than that picture of it. We're going to use that equation for average shear stress, uh, but we're also going to uh, uh, complexify it a little bit. So if I imagine uh, shear stress, in this case, I've got a cube uh, that is fixed to a lower surface down here, and I have a shear stress along its surface in the left to right direction here. Now, if these are the only forces acting on this, there's no normal stresses here, um, then I can say, okay, this guy down here, this stress, has to be equal to that one. Why? Because the force in the right to left, left to right direction up here has to be the same as the force in the right to left direction. If I've got the same area here, and the same area on the bottom, that means I also have the same stress. Okay, so if this cube is in equilibrium, tau zy has to be the same magnitude as tau prime zy. Now, if we just had those two forces, right, we wouldn't move in the x direction, but we would start to rotate, right? If I put my axis in the center here, I'd have a torque in the clockwise direction and uh, nothing resisting it and so I'd have rotation. So I've got to have something else and it turns out we need some shear forces along the sides here. Okay, so we're assuming there are uh, 
cubes along next to it. That this is an element uh, amongst others. Uh, and so there's got to be some kind of shear force here and shear force here. Again, we don't have any acceleration in the up-down up direction, so they have to be equal and opposite. Uh, and in order to stop the rotation, they have to be counterclockwise. And so with this element um, of, you know, in a very simple situation where we have a material with a shear stress on top um, that's fixed on the bottom, um, we have to have four shear stresses that are always equal. Okay, now that's going to be more complex in more complex situations, but you can see that that complementary property is going to hold even in more complex situations. These might not be equal all the time, but we're going to have to have, we can't just have shear in one direction um, because that would lead to rotation. And so we're going to have to have a shear on one coordinate direction, in this case, left to right, has to be matched with some kind of shear in the up-down direction on the other sides of our element. And so shear in one direction creates shear in another direction. All right, so let's look at, uh, we won't get too much into that, the ideas of complementary shear. Those will uh, be important to us later. Uh, and we're going to go back to a relatively simple instance here of simple shear. Where, where can we ignore those complications uh, and just use tau equals V over A? Well, a pin is a nice example where we can do that. Um, like if we have a pin here and a load being applied by this uh, hydraulic uh, piece here, um, that pin uh, is held in place by shear internal uh, forces. Okay, and we can see that, let's say, you know, the force on the pin is pushing with applied force F. We're going to have to have some shear forces uh, along there. And so we'll do a quick question here. So pause and answer that. All you have to do here is solve a, a, the statics problem, right? That pin is staying in the same place. Um, what can we say about those forces? And on to the next slide. So now let's actually look at a problem and see what um, uh, how we might find a shear force um, in an actual situation. So again, here's a, a thing, a thing that does some things or holds some things in place. Uh, and we want to find the shear stress in the pins at A and at B. Since both ends of the beam are supported, uh, we can't just ignore, uh, just pick one section and ignore support forces. We're going to have to find our support forces. Um, so that'll be our first step. So what do we do uh, in order to find our support forces? <laughs> we draw a free body diagram. Woohoo! He says, uh, let's draw that free body diagram. So go ahead and do that. And we'll end up with a free body diagram that looks like this, right? We have a, if we just draw the beam, we've got a couple of support forces over here, and we've got a support force FB over here, uh, and we have our load. So we've got four applied forces here. And um, go ahead and find those. So do a little statics practice and pause here and answer those questions on Moodle. And then we'll go on to the next slide. Oh, not yet. Now we have to determine the shear stress in those pins. So we want to, now that we know what AX, AY, and FB are, in other words, the forces that are acting on this, the loads, uh, then we can find those shear stresses. So in order to do that, we need the magnitude of our force at A. So we know AX and AY. Let's find our magnitude. And we find that the magnitude of the force is 
uh, kilonewtons. So you can check your answers for AX and AY there. And that gives us the, the magnitude of the force that's being, that this pin is supporting. Now that's supported by two shear forces, right? Just like we saw on that early example. So we know this, we know the, the force that the pin is supporting. And so finding the shear force uh, is a matter of figuring out, first of all, what is each section here supporting? Each section is supporting half of that force, right? Or reacting to half of that force. So VA is going to be 10.7 kilonewtons. And then to find the shear stress, we're just going to find, we're going to use our equation, right? That our shears, average shear stress is going to be the force uh, divided by the area. So we find the area of our pin here. Uh, and we find that the supported force is 34 uh, megapascals. And that holds for each one, right? So on each of both this surface here and that surface there, we have a shear stress of 34 megapascals. That's the, um, the average shear stress. Now, uh, for the last part, go ahead and solve for the shear stress at pin B. Uh, and remember that at pin B, pin B looks like this, we only have one um, shear stress because the, the cable here is attached to a one-sided pin. And once you answer that on Moodle, you're done with this lecture.